Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan, Deputy Editor, and today I'm going to be in conversation with Mr. Subhash Chandra Garg, who's a former Finance Secretary, former Economic Affairs Secretary, and he's written an absolutely insightful and informative book analyzing not just budget 2024-25, the latest one, but also the two budgets before that and what's happened with them. So we're going to, of course, discuss that, but also about various other facets of the economy and the regulatory space. Thank you so much, Mr. Gar, for joining us. Thank you, us. Sharad. You have been an avid reader. I guess you have read that book. Uh, I have, and, certainly. Uh, it's very fascinating, very pleasing to me to have a talk or a discussion on this book, which uh, is my love's labor's labor labor of love's lost. All right. So to say, spend a lot of time, and I've tried to put together something which I think is very much needed in the country. A very informative, insightful, as you said, and a comprehensive analysis of what Absolutely. the budget actually is. For many, it's a very mystifying kind of document. Right. Half clear, a lot of things not clear. So I hope this conversation today will help uh, in taking it forward to a lot of people. Thank no, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I, you said it's comprehensive and absolutely it is. And there it brings out various facets that I thought were very interesting, especially to do with something like capital expenditure. Because, you know, right now there's a lot of talk about the government's capex push and how that is what is driving growth in the economy. But the analysis you have done shows that we should view capital expenditure and through two lenses. One is, is the capex actually increasing or is it just a substitution of other capex going from this area to that area? And two, is the capex being done in a productive area or is it in non-productive uses? So looking at these two, through these two lenses, how would you categorize the government's capex, say even the 11.11 lakh crore capex in this latest budget, how would you categorize it? So you rightly said the capex is very important mm -hmm. because capital expenditure is investment, investments create productive assets and productive assets create a lot of further um, uh, goods and services in the economy which promotes the uh, growth in the economy. So capex is important. Right. But for the capex to be important and to make contribution to the economy, the two things which you mentioned are very necessary. Number one, it should actually be a capex. Right. It should grow. Mm -hmm. Is it growing or not growing? That's one, uh, one thing. If numbers say that the capex is increasing, but actually the capex uh, is not increasing, then that will not make that contribution. Absolutely. And secondly, that capex has to be a productive capex because it should add to the economic capacity right. of, the, of the economy to produce more goods and services. So from those two lenses, if you analyze the, the big story of the Modi government, which actually began in 2022, mm -hmm. not before, uh, I have... Uh, elsewhere also written that until 2021, the capex was not the big story right. for the government. Correct. It began for two, 2022 and now for three to four years, the capex is the big daddy, big uh, guy out, the USP of the government. Right. right. So on your first question or remark, um, I would invite your attention to look at the statement number one in the budget itself. Right. There is a document called Expenditure Profile, mm -hmm. which uh, has the abstract of the government's expenditures. Right. Uh, it, in addition to the government's own expenditure, which mm -hmm. it does through ministries and departments and its own organizations, right. um, it also has the capex contribution from the public sector enterprises right. of the government. For example, yes. let us take railways or NHAI or NTPCs or right. the power grids of the world, mm -hmm. which are the government's own public sector enterprises. So that documents put together uh, the total capex by these two entities, so to say, government and what we technically call IEBR, 
internal and extra budgetary resources of the CPEs. Of the CPEs, yeah, right. Yeah, right. So these two together constitutes the capex. The total, total, total capex. Ca total capex. Right. And if you would look at this number mm -hmm. in the same documents and compare 1819 total capex of the government and the CPSCs right. to 23-24 capex, you would find the growth is only about 5%. I see. Which is less than the inflation during this period. Right. So, actual total capex has not grown. What has happened is that the government had expanded its capex through departments, especially the railways and the roads. Mm -hmm. And um, those organizations, the railways and the NHAIs, stopped raising IEBRs. I see. So instead of it going through the PSEs, it's going through the government departments. To but the same organization. The same right. organization is spending, mm -hmm. but it's spending what government provided instead of what you raised from the market. I see. So much so that the NHAI capex has become zero uh, in 23-24. I see. Uh, likewise, the railways capex has sub come down substantially. I have done that analysis and given Correct. those numbers that um, at some point in time about 57% of the capex used to come from the NHI's own resources mm -hmm. um, and if it is coming zero then the total capex will not increase. Right, so it's more uh, a substitution than an actual increase. Exactly, so this is point number one mm -hmm. and the second issue which you raised is the productivity of expenditure. Right. So if you do a capex which builds machine machinery, which builds infrastructure, which Build, builds buildings and all and then it contributes to the production of goods and services in the economy. Right. A, a, ra a, ra a new rail track which then mm -hmm. creates more passenger trains or the goods train which creates more of the freight transport or the, uh, or the passenger transport. That is what adds to the economy. Right. right? But there are many capex uh, which un were undertaken during this period. Mm -hmm. uh, which did not contribute to that. Uh, let me cite two examples. Right. For, uh, one was the Air India. Right? Mm -hmm. So when Air India was to be privatized, the, uh, the government uh, did a deal. And in that deal, the debt which was on the books of the Air India was taken over by the government. Yes. Right. And for taking that over, the government provided the equity to one of its entities. And this was classified as capex. This was classified as capex because in accounting terms, giving equity to a, co a company which you uh, which which is your own company is capex, right? Right. But that is not a single rupee of extra expenditure on productive assets. It's Absolutely. only to retire the old unpaid liabilities of the Air India. Likewise, look at the another big elephant in the uh, in the room, the BSNL. Yes. So in the BSNL last year, I think the, the government gave about ninety thousand crores equity infusion, uh, equity and other uh, which is which is the capex kind of thing. Mm. And the, where where does that go? That goes for two or three things. Number one, it funds the licensing fee which the private sector pays, but the BSNL or the MTNL doesn't pay. It comes back to the government in the form of this. Right. So Which why, is the taxpayer who pays then. So, in, in fact, that if you go by the accounting uh, conventions, it falsifies the government accounts in two ways. Number one, you have uh, treated some thing mm -hmm. as capex which is actually not capex right. and on the other hand when that BSNL pays you that amount as a license fee you are treating it as a revenue. And this is money that you have given BSNL so it can it pay you. It come back to you. Right. So your both sides you see the, uh, the in inflation into it. Likewise, um, uh, when the government expands loans to the state governments, mm -hmm. it doesn't result into the central government's capex. Right. right. It goes to the state. If the state spends on creating some capital assets, it then becomes a capex of the state government, right. not of the center. 
and in last few years the so called capital uh, loans this 50 year interest free exactly right so that has expanded the capex uh, capital expenditure of the central government without actually really contributing the uh, the real capex so there are um, these are the quality kind of thing where nominally you have a capital expenditure mm -hmm. but you don't actually have a capital expenditure so i think both on both these accounts the if you take this out then you would find that the capex growth cagr right annual growth is less than even 5% wow and uh, now sticking to uh, capital expenditure especially when when we talk about capital expenditure mostly people talk about building roads bridges railways but what your analysis has found is that capex on transport actually has not grown all that much uh so could you tell us a little more about that no the transport capex has actually grown okay so most of the capex goes for railways mm -hmm. and the roads and the metros about 65% of the capex actually goes for for this kind of expenditure of the government right but the trouble there is different okay the trouble is that if you actually invest and it raises your uh, capacity to transport more passengers mm -hmm. and carry more traffic that should be reflected in the increased passenger share uh, of of your um, railways taking taking that up yes but if you see the numbers the railways passengers carrying is is declining substantially in last 5 despite years, capex going up despite the capex going up i see so last 5 years if you would look at it uh, you would find the uh, the annual carrying of passengers by railways is actually down by 20% over the last 5 years so we are comparing to pre covid pre covid that's correct right so post covid the rest of the economy airlines or mm -hmm. the road sector has um, has come back enormously and you you find that the passenger and the foot, uh, freight is is much more right. but railways passenger uh, uh, transportation is actually down so that raises the another question about the productivity of what you do on the ex, uh, on the transportation expenditure right uh, i have a much better view about the um, the capex on roads mm -hmm. because that roads the government in road sector is is barring some uh, state road transport undertakings uh, does not uh, provide the transportation service on roads it's private sector so right. you have the taxis you have cars you have uh, so many other even now the bus sector also is expanding through the private sector and they have used the better roads to increase the the services right right so that is where the growth is reflected indirectly that the government has spent on roads which is fine though not very much if you take the reduction in nhai's own capex yes. that's a different point but whatever has been done even smaller growth mm -hmm. that has contributed to the economy much more than the railways uh, capex expenditure i see because railways capex expenditure has not even is resulted into pro higher revenues for railways or higher uh, gdp contribution so is there a substitution that's happening that freight from railways is now going through trucks because the road network is much better see this is a long term story mm -hmm. the railways freight is also increasing it's not that it's not increasing okay it's increasing by uh, 10% on an average um, uh, though sometimes it fluctuates more right. or more more or less but the freight increase in the economy is much higher so you constantly losing share yes despite growing passenger is a different story passenger you are losing even in absolute amount right absolute numbers right that is where to my mind i uh, categorized and i have asked the government to look at very carefully on the railway capex mm. and unless we um, literally dismantle railways uh, and make it a private sector entity much like uh, the power sector experience where 
we used to have power departments in this state, but the government of India came up with NTPC. Yes. Initially, NTPC also had transportation, uh, tra transmission with it, but transmission was uh, substituted into, uh, into this power grid. Correct. And now we have uh, in power sector, in generation at least, a very fine company, NTPC, another one, power grid. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the railways also need to be dismantled into trans transportation or the uh, track business into, into one and the passenger business elsewhere. Unless we do that, uh, the, the, the privatization or the increase in traffic of the railways will not take place. The government tried some time back to sort of introduce private trains. But those terms were so badly designed that except contributing the train, nothing was in the hands of the private sector. Right. Your own driver, you will collect the revenues and then you will pass on. So no one showed interest. That's, a, that's not the kind of model on which people, India will work. And the railways, when you say privatization, you mean just making them, just hiring them into different companies. The, the companies will still be owned by the government? Not necessarily. Some part will like power grid is owned by them, but you can also allow the new um, uh, tracks making in the private sector companies. So competition right. comes uh, like power grid today has, I think, of the new uh, construction or new mm -hmm. uh, transmission lines, something like 65-70% share. But they are now 30% share of the new transmission lines is with the private sector. So likewise, you can do the track business. But the other business, the um, transportation business, like in the in the airlines or in the road sector, mm -hmm. uh, should be completely privatized. But there is uh, also then the strategic angle because the things like troop movements and all of that does happen through railways. So you can't entirely also give it up. I think this is a bogey. This is strategic. Right. The, uh, every time you throw this in the case of BSNL, MTNL also, you throw this argument yes. that it's a strategic sector. Uh, BSNL share today is less than 8%. Absolutely. What kind of... Uh, and MTNL is less than 1%. Yeah, so uh, every year they lose thousands of crores of rupees. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all over the world, we, we, the, the troops are carried if the railways is in the private sector, does it not carry the, the soldiers? No, of course it does. It, it can carry, uh, you, you have to pay for. Today, when you are you're prepared to make a lot of arms and ammunition in the private sector, running of trains in the private sector cannot be less strategic or cannot have any strategic disadvantage. I don't think that argument holds. Right. And uh, now speaking of government expenditure and another uh, aspect that is in the news right now is of course the unified pension scheme and the uh, NPS. You have argued before that the death of NPS is imminent, that you see it happening uh, soon. But then what happens to the private sector? Because it's not as if UPS is going to be expanded to the private sector. Companies are not going to come forward and be like, we'll give a guaranteed pension to everybody. So if then NPS also dies, then what about what happens to the private sector and pension plans there? See, the NPS has not been extended to the private sector, which to my mind has been a bad decision. The private sector, the organized sector is covered by what is EPFO. EPFO, yes. Right. So EPFO has a, a component of scheme called EPS, mm -hmm. which is Employees Pension Scheme. And that EPS is supposed to take care of the private sector's organized pensions. Right. right. Uh, there was a lot of argument when this was being designed, uh, the, the NPS was designed for the government that we should offer the NPS option to the private sector, let the companies choose yep. either the EPFO or the NPS. NPS. Right. But the, N the EPFO uh, sort of system won over the day. They mm. said, no, 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 it's a very established system, we can't do it. So what is happening in the NPS, in the private sector is that either those establishments which are not covered by EP EPFO, 
either those are below 10 with power 20 that's a small small uh, enterprise uh, right small enterprises they can choose to be under the nps mm-hmm. or the individuals themselves are uh, sort of uh, registering themselves in the nps right for their own individual but that will be without the employer contribution then that is without the employer's contribution yeah. um, the small segment might be contributing but mm. that system doesn't distinguish it right. it comes as um, the employee's contribution so that segment is unlikely to be affected that's a small one mm. and uh, there is no way uh, as you said rightly that they would expand uh, or to or they will provide a guarantee uh, of the of the pension incidentally when this is also i i i try to highlight in the nps uh, or the ups now right the government is offering a minimum pension of 10000 rupees per month yes. right uh, if you have done 10 years of service are you aware what is the guaranteed pension in the eps of the EPS? i do not know right there the guaranteed pension is only 1000 rupees i see right they have been demanding that raise it to at least 1500 2000 for many years mm-hmm. the government is refusing to do it and um, as much as about 1/4 of the uh, eps pensioners receive minimum pension that is uh, that shows to you the power of the government servants of course to sort of um, get for themselves extraordinary benefits the ups is a compromise uh, you moving towards uh, what we call ops now right. slowly the government in to, uh, 2018 decided to raise it to 14% contribution yes right that was uh, first kind of concession after 2003 4 when the nps was brought in and uh, now in 2024 you have moved to give a guaranteed 50% pension although with contributory no systems. that is a uh, a fig leaf that the government says that we'll make contribution mm-hmm. right tomorrow if you don't make contribution what happens it's still guaranteed guarantee stays yes. but contribution may or may not stay to that extent it remain if the government makes contribution it remains funded but it doesn't uh, uh, reduce the liability of the government government has increased its liability from yes. 10% earlier now 50% pension and i am quite uh, convinced the way things move next 3 or 4 years it will be ops and it's uh, indexed to inflation it's a, no that i think is a little doubtful i have my interpretation is that the the pension 50% mm-hmm. of your last year's pay is guaranteed and that is indexed for future inflation i see unlike what happens in the case of ops where you get 50% of the basic plus the present da right I, I think understand. this this is an interpretation issue. S- many people are trying to interpret that um, the government has guaranteed fifty percent of pay plus DA. Mm-hmm. My interpretation is that no, at this stage the government has only guaranteed fifty percent of basic of pay. Of basic pay, which is then indexed. Right. right. So if you are today, let us say uh, uh, DA is about fifty percent, so. you get 75% 75 rupees as pension 100 plus 50 divided by 250% right is 75 whereas in my interpretation it is 100 divided by 2 is 50 is your pension and that 50 in future if the inflation goes up by 5% that will increase by 5% it's I not see. 75 that is going to increase. that is i see so i think that is but that would be the that might probably be the next uh, uh, assault on it that mm-hmm. give us 50% of the basic pay plus da right so and finally uh, the last leftover of the gpf contribution or the employees contribution 10% which doesn't come back to it the, the government has in this ups tried to say that we'll give you some mm-hmm. lump sum 
but that's not equivalent to your 10% contribution. In the OPS, with the GPF, you get the entire contribution back with interest. Right. So that is another grouse which I think the employees will demand. And uh, so the government has opened the way to dismantle the, uh, NPS. the NPS. And yes. you are going through the journey. I have a parallel to cite if you want to see this uh, ex-servicemen demand uh, for equivalent pension mm -hmm. for the existing service that, that worked many years. But in 10 to 12 years, finally they got what, uh, uh, what they demanded originally, the, the pension equivalent to the existing service right. uh, people retiring. That is what everyone has got. So how does one square this circle? Clearly, the, the government servants, uh, the civil services, they have extraordinary power uh, and extraordinary influence with the government. But... They're also a very small percentage of the population and the rest of the taxpayers are then funding this process. So uh, how does one, is this going to continue, you feel? Uh, of course, one of the, I think signals are very clear. Hmm. Uh, even if the wider uh, system of the government servants, taking the central government, um, its public sector enterprises, many of them follow um, the government rules or the state governments, local bodies, all together, um, that's not small by the way, that's about 2 crore, um, right. roughly about 30% uh, uh, of the total organized labor, hmm. 30 or 25% of the total organized labor, that's very large. 90% uh, of the labor in the country has no real pension security, yes. right? it's, it's very discriminatory in comparison to that and as you said, the taxpayers fund it. And uh, the taxpayers should be aware, they should be aware, that's what I try to do in this book. Yes. Understand where is your money where going. Where is your money going, yeah. Don't raise superficial issues, go into the real issues right. and then understand where. And raise the level of debate. Uh, I think the taxpayers should become very active participants in how the government spends their, their money. No, right. absolutely. Okay, so now... Switching gears uh, a little bit, you, during your career, you've also been a member of the board of SEBI. Yes. And so that's why my next question is going to come up. You've earlier, when Hindenburg made its allegations about uh, SEBI chairperson uh, Madhavi Puri Butch, you had said at the time that she should resign. But since then, a lot of water has flowed under the bridge. Congress has been making a lot of new allegations. Several people have been making a lot of new allegations. But the Butches, SEBI and even ICICI Bank have all defended themselves quite vigorously with detailed statements and all of that. Do you still stand by your statement that she should resign? See, I was not only the member of the SEBI board, I was the Secretary of Economic Affairs, yes. which is the administrative department in charge of SEBI. Yes. So all the laws which SEBI implements or governed by are framed in the Department of Economic Affairs. They administer it. Right. right. So that uh, so I, I had a very close association with, uh, with what the SEBI functions. And in the first piece I wrote, I uh, brought out the professional competence and uh, um, uh, singularity of the uh, Madhvi Butch for being a very eminent and good uh, selection as first as a member. I wasn't in the system when she was selected as the chairperson, You're right. but as a member I had watched her uh, performance very closely. She worked with us on many issues mm -hmm. and her contributions were, was, were very, uh, very, very valuable, very good. and. Uh, that's what I wrote in that piece. Right. But then I, uh, taking on what the Hindenburg uh, allegations were and how her investment relationship with the offshore funds controlled by the Adanis who the SEBI was supposed to be investigating and in particular uh, running business outside uh, in the form of those two Agora advisories right. the and being the ownership. So uh, with, with many of these things, I... I concluded that her position had, be, had become increasingly untenable. Mm -hmm. I didn't think uh, that there was any corruption. 
but these were more of the indiscretions and uh, which puts her into a conflict of interest kind of situation right. and therefore my suggestion was that uh, she should resign right i wrote another piece after m many more um, uh, of the revelations came about the icic bank salary payments rent and many other things which came up and in that piece i uh, uh, i i started finding some element of um, even corruption right okay so not serious kind of thing because uh, not corruption i would call it i would call it misconduct okay. uh, so if you are running an advisory which is earning money where your husband is is employed and you are 99% owner that is certainly misconduct mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it is not corruption right likewise if the rents are off market rents given by an entity of course which you are uh, regulating uh, you may or may not be participating in those discussions but if it is off market we don't know then it is uh, misconduct right right uh, if not corruption again uh, likewise were they kind of extra concessions offered to her in terms of the esops their encashment exercise price and things like that while they have defended themselves these aspects have not been uh, sort of clarified clarified right right um, these are these have not been and the more you sort of try to cover by using languages like others are motivated or trying to mislead etc the factual position if it remains unspecified and clarified then it doesn't allow the the satisfaction in the people who are trying to objectively assess what uh, what had happened right so then my conclusion was uh, that more you try to sort of defend brazen it out that's the, the the expression i used it will hurt your credibility mm -hmm. your uh, your uh, government's credibility and the city's credibility and in my judgment i think there are two options which i think are still relevant number one either you sort of put out facts relating to all these questions Right. which i just read some of them i raised there are many other questions and have an independent body assess the veracity of those uh, allegations and your responses right and if you believe that you are um, perfectly clear you have not done anything wrong then this twin tests of complete disclosure plus uh, certification by an independent body will clear you out and you continue right right but if you are not prepared to expose yourself to this kind of scrutiny i don't think it is advisable to brazen it out in that case it's better to sort of quit and go that's quit what i hold I my position still and uh, so now you can actually also provide us with a little clarity on the powers of the department of economic affairs itself can it uh, remove her from office or are there what are the particular norms under which it can remove her from office of course the government has uh, two or three options in mm -hmm. the law number one is um, uh, it can remove right uh, if there are the certain conditions mentioned if you you become bankrupt or your moral turpitude uh, right those those may not be the case right now because mm -hmm. things have not been proven it's in the allegation space right. so possibly uh, um, those are not strictly attracted but um, you can sort of if you find that there is a question uh, of the moral turpitude then you may give a notice and ask for the explanation and if you conclude that yes it's the case you may remove it so that's one right. process where um, by by giving the notice i don't think 
that the government is going to do it. Mm -hmm. The second option is to give a simple notice of pay, three months uh, notice and pay and ask her to go. Or if you pay the advance, then you can ask. So the government has these options. I'm not saying the government um, will exercise them, but that is what uh, the government's authority Yeah, is. I just wanted to know, what are the legal... The these are the two legal options, options that it has. Them. Yes. I see. Okay. And, and, right. and more, uh, these are very sensitive positions. Even if the government puts a hint, she'll resign and go. Uh, that hmm. is not legally provided in the rules. But it works very effectively. If you just give a signal, I think she'll go. So then it's safe to also say that right now, since she has not resigned, there's maybe no signal from the government yet saying that maybe the you should The only go. statement I noted two days back, uh, Finance Minister in one of the yes. interviews did say that we have to take facts on board. Uh, wa was she meaning to take the facts which... Madhvi Butch has provided, treating them as fact into consideration and then say that no, 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 nothing is to be done. Or it was not very clear, but she sounded a little bit uh, concerned that these allegations are there. Right. And the facts, either of both sides, need to be taken into account. So that is the only statement which has come up, uh, which is in a way indicated what the government might be thinking mm -hmm. or might be because at one point in time politically or otherwise so i think the the government would have an assessment of course is she a political liability now mm. bigger than the asset asset she has been right, right? Uh, but if there is an assessment that it's becoming more of a liability then the government would uh, exercise some options, including the last one which I mentioned. Right. But whether this stage has been reached, I can't say. Today. Of course. Uh, but on that note, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations on your book. Thank you very much and very happy to talk to you on these aspects. I, as I said in the beginning, it's very important for all our taxpayers, for all people. Mm -hmm. I have devoted this book to everyone, the taxpayers, the people who sort of contribute. And by the way, so many people, it's not only the income tax guys. Of course. But every one of us pay tax in the form of these indirect taxes and yes. all. So everybody has stake in the budget. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should be concerned about it. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir.